Hello, welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about the evidence of evolution. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. So we are still under subunit 1, the evidence for evolution, and as the title of the video suggests, we will be focusing on the different evidence that support evolution. Of all the major fields of biology, the theory that today's organisms evolved from now extinct ancestors is perhaps, perhaps the best known to the general public. Um, not because um, uh, that, that an average person thoroughly understand, um, understands the basic facts of evolution, but because most of, um, uh, most of them see evolution as a challenge um, against their uh, religious beliefs. Okay? So it's mostly, um, this theory of evolution is mostly met with um, hostility or resistance from uh, those people who cling to their religious beliefs and feel threatened whenever the subject is being talked about. So similar highly publicized criticisms of evolution has, have occurred ever since the time of Darwin and it continues up to this um, time and period. And this actually extends not only about the evolution of human, oh, the evolution of living things, but also evolution of humans, the origin of life, the origin of the earth, and then the origin of the universe. So all of those, um, all of those uh, major questions that science attempt to uh, answer through theories are usually met with uh, public criticisms. So for this reason, it is important for you as, your, as students of biology, as, as students of life science, that we have to um, be familiar with the evidence for evolution. Okay? So, um, as, as a student studying this course, it's important for you, regardless of your religious beliefs, it's important for you to know what uh, the evidence um, are and what are they pointing to and how they were able to really come up with a holistic, uh, comprehensive explanation on why organisms appear as they are and why, why they behave as they are and what's their function in our ecosystem and biosphere. So, yeah. Now, uh, just a quick note, no? So, most of the, mo in most of the slides, you, you will see the word evidence, even if um, I'm referring to multiple pieces of evidence, because, you know, I, I just checked that there's, re there's no plural for the word evidence, just like no plural in, uh, in, for the word news and furniture and jewelry. So, I think it's, it's the, be the better way to say it is pieces of evidence. However, you know, I might, you know, I might have some, um, I might forget and might, and I might say evidences, but, you know, just, to, just, to, just for you to know, it's pieces of evidence for evolution. So these are the four major evidence of evolution. The first one would be the fossil record, then anatomical record, molecular record, and artificial selection. And we will, we will go through all of this one by one. So um, before we continue, I recommend that you watch this video from Stated Clearly, What is the Evidence for Evolution? A very comprehensive um, discussion on the different evidence that, that we will actually talk about. So I'll provide the link in the description below. So number one, the fossil record. So it is claimed that it is the most direct evidence that evolution has occurred because these are actually physical records, physical um, physical um, remains of organisms that used to live in the past and are no longer um, alive or present in, in the modern period. So today we have a far more, far more complete understanding of the fossil record than it was available in Darwin's time. So we have more uh, fossils that we've discovered nowadays than during Darwin's time. So, as we all know, fossils are the preserved remains of a once living organism. Okay? So, here in this um, image, we see the fossil remains of Mesosaurus found in the Permian sed sediments in Africa and South America. Okay? If you still remember our lesson about plate tectonics, the fossil record is also one of the supporting evidence of, uh, of that theory of plate tectonics, of continental drift because they found the same fossil 
imagine uh, from Africa and South America, which are nowadays separated by the Atlantic Ocean. So it means that um, those, those slabs of land or those plates used to be connected and these organisms used to travel back and forth through those land and they can they they die on Africa they die, they died in South America and then eventually you know through the movement of the plates they eventually become separated by a body of ocean uh, through the movements uh, of the plates um, but still they left behind the fossils this fo their fossils uh, suggesting that those lands were used used to be connected so, uh, Mesosaurus was a freshwater species and so clearly incapable of crossing the Atlantic. Okay? So, it must have lived in the lakes and rivers of the formerly contiguous or connected landmass that, that later become, became Africa and South America, which drifted apart during the Cretaceous um, period. Okay? So, so, this is an example of a fossil. So this is the timeline of history of life as revealed by the fossil record. Okay, so the first one, the first living organisms who, who first appeared in the fossil record are the eukaryotes, uh, and then followed by after uh, a gap of millions, hundreds and millions of years, were the vertebrates. So those were the primitive um, ancestors of fish who live in water. Then uh, around um, 400 mil million years ago, they were able to colonize land and adapt to to dry land. We're in some of them evolved to, to give rise to the amphibians, though they are still highly dependent on water. But around 300 million years ago, some of, uh, some of those organisms evolved to become less dependent with water, water, so they were able to move a little bit farther away from the water, giving rise to the group of reptiles. And some of those, those reptiles evolved to become your dinosaurs, while others evolved to become mammals. Okay? So around 200 million years ago, the, fir the first birds... Um, which are actually more related to, to um, dinosaurs, appeared as well as the flowering plants. Then around this time, 100 million years ago, uh, would be the extinction of the dinosaurs due to a catastrophic event. So the remaining mammals were the ones who flourished during, during this time and gave rise to the first hominids. So in the 17th century, uh, Nicholas Steno uh, was able to shook, to shook or sh uh, to shock the world of science by noting the similarities between the shark teeth he keep on finding all around and the rocks commonly known as tongue stones. So it was normal in the past to, 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 to go to places and see this shark stone, uh, these stones, and people thought that they were tongue stones. However, um, in his studies, Tenno was able to see that these are actually more similar to the uh, shark tooth of, uh, or tooth of a shark of the of modern day shark. So he made a leap and declared that these tongue stones were actually teeth of the of once living sharks. Um, uh, so that was uh, our first understanding that fossils were actually, such as these tongue stones, were actually a record of the past life of organisms. So here uh, we see we see that fossils can tell us about the growth patterns in animals. So this is a cross section of an adult. A thigh bone of a duckbill dinosaur, Meiasaura. So the white spaces show us that the, this, there were lots, uh, lots of blood, blood vessels running through the bone, which indicates that this is a fast-growing bone. Okay, so they were able to compare these fossils with the structure of modern-day animals and see the similarities and differences that allowed them to come up with these conclusions. So this video is from Ted Ed. So I recommend that you watch this video because it will tell us more about Nicholas Steno and how he was able to make connections with tongue stones and them being the being part of the fossil record. So this is entitled "The Most Groundbreaking Scientist You've Never Heard Of." I'll provide the link in the description below. To learn more about the fossil evidence, I recommend that you visit this um, from Berkeley. Uh, University Ev Understanding Evolution. I'll provide the link in the description below. And this is from Biologos. What does the fossil record show? Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. So one of the best studied cases of the fossil record would be the evolution of horses. Okay. Um, uh, so th these species, again, species are always 
pronounced with an S or and written with an S, even if we're just talking to one group. Um, so, yun, it's always species. Uh, so, these species uh, are classified in the genus Equus and the last living descendants of a long lineage that produced 34 genera since its origin in the Eocene period. So, what's good about the fossil record of horses is that they are actually well preserved and they were, we were able to map out and create a timeline on the changes in the body size of those horses from their primitive ancestors, okay? Through, uh, it, it, uh, the fossil record shows us that the changes involve increase in size and also, although some showed us decrease in size, until they reach the modern day genus of horses. Uh, so the examination of these horse foss fossils has provided a particularly well-documented case on how evolution has proceeded by adaptation to changing environments. So th this, these changes in their size um, is actually due to, to their ability or due to their need to adapt to their changing environments. So to further explain that, I recommend that you watch this video from PBS Eons, How Horses Took Over North America Twice, that explains uh, the change that they underwent through in their body size. I'll provide the link in the description below. So the fossil record can only be considered complete if all the transitional fossils um, are present or are discovered. So a transitional fossil is any fossilized remains of a life form that exhibits traits common to both the ancestral group and its derived descendant group. Okay? So a transitional fossil shows us how, how that the ancestral group or the ancestors transition to become it's um, to, to look like its descendants okay so for example here so if we can find transitional fossils here that shows us how this species transitioned or evolved or changed to become this species then we can say that that they have um, a complete uh, fossil record or they have a good fossil record that shows their um, evolution so we, we see here on this um, photo a reconstruction of a female Australopithecus afarensis. So this is um, how um, she would probably look like based on the fossils she left behind. I'm not sure if you're familiar, no, but I've, I hope you've heard about the fossil they named uh, Lucy. So she was the one, she was considered um, um, a transitional fossil okay, because she, she showed... Um, traits common to the ancestral group before Australopithecus afarensis and then future species after her. Um, and by the way, um, she was named Lucy because uh, that, um, those fossils were discovered in, in the campsite and then the song Lucy in the Sky with the Diamonds by the Beatles was continuously played and then eventually they named her Lucy. That's why I'm also thinking of naming one of my future daughters Lucy and then I'll tell her that she was named after a famous uh, fossil hopefully and of course I love the character from one of my old school favorite anime Magic Knight Ray Earth wherein the protagonist there was also named Lucy anyway Darwin described the lack of trans transitional fossils in his time during his time again we have a more uh, complete record of the fossils nowadays than during his time he described that the lack of transitional fossils um, is the most obvious and, and gravest um, objection which can be ur argued or urged against his theory. Okay, so um, that was the one, of, one of the major criticisms of natural selection or the, the theory of evolution based on natural selection because of the lack of transitional fossils in his time. But he was able to explain that. It could, be, um, it, it could be because of extreme imperfection of the geological record, which is also beyond anybody's control. Right? Not that uh, it's the theory's fault, it's that we have um, certain limitations based on geomorphological processes. Okay? So these are the reasons why the fossil record is relatively incomplete. Okay? From the time of Darwin and right na na nowadays, modern period, we are, we are still completing the fossil record. So we, we still have geologists and paleontologists, scientists and biologists digging for fossil record. So first, soft tissues are rarely preserved. So soft tissues such as muscles and internal organs are rarely preserved. So if you notice, 
most of the fossils are actually made up of bones of those organisms bones okay such as um, part of the teeth and then bones okay the skeletal bones or skeletal system of those organisms so soft um soft tissues are rarely preserved and then movement of the earth's crust could have uh, destroyed or covered many of these fossils so if you still remember our lesson about the rock cycle okay so we all know that those sediments could eventually be pushed down or pressed down deep into the earth's um, um it deep, deep into the earth and can be melted and become part of magma so there's a possibility that some of those fossils got destroyed as well or sometimes the fossils from the sediments can be lifted up in, into slowly lifted up through endogenic processes to become parts of uh, to become the new mountains but through weathering and erosion some of those fossils could have been destroyed so it's quite to find to for an organism to die in the perfect spot which is mostly about sedimentary rocks okay, around sedimentary rocks or clay or near bodies of water for them to die in the perfect spot for them to be preserved in the perfect spot for them to be protected against um, movements of the earth's crust those are actually the reasons why it's quite rare to find fossils fossilization takes place only in certain types i've mentioned that a while ago in favorable environments you need to die uh, the organism need to die in the correct in the correct area in the correct uh, region it, it has to be protected from geological processes and then it has to be excavated by the correct people and to be to be examined by the collect um by the right people and then paleontologists have not dug every place on earth okay they have not yet seen all the fossils yet so we are still in the process of so perhaps we have only dug up to this region so we need to dig deeper we need to dig more to find all of those um, fossils and then to complete the fossil record but we are hopeful that that's the direction that we are going to so Australopithecus afarensis was a transitional fossil for um, hominids and we have another transitional fossil here Archaeopteryx okay so Archaeopteryx is one of the most famous transitional fossils and gives the evidence of evolution of birds from theropod dinosaurs so as you can see the body of this Archaeopteryx was perfectly preserved it died in the perfect spot okay? even some of this feather its feathers um, or, or imprints of its feathers can be seen so it was discovered in 1861 and you know a, a classic transitional uh, fossil between dinosaurs and birds many more transitional fossils have been discovered since then and there is now abundant evidence of how all classes of vertebrates okay, we, it's, we are quite lucky vertebrates have, have um, sturdy bones sturdy skeletal systems that can be fossilized well and much of it in the form of transitional fossils so if you're interested you can visit this from life science Ar archaeopteryx the transitional fossil more information about it and why it's special i'll provide the link in the description below now these two videos um, i also recommend that you watch them this is from um, pbs eons one of my favorite youtube channel um, when birds had teeth i'll provide the link in the description below and this is how did this is entitled how did dinosaurs evolve into birds from discovery news again i'll provide the links of these videos in the description below now another transitional fossil would be tiktaalik it's a monospecific monospecific genus of an extinct sarcoptegerian terigian or lobe finned fish from the late devonian period so uh, tiktaalik is uh, a representative um, transitional organism from fish to amphibia so it has a fish-like body but with um, appendages that allow them to move on land okay so it is an example of several lines of ancient sarcopterygian fish developing adaptations for to the oxygen poor water so they came from um, oxygen rich water to oxygen poor land um, so it has adaptations uh, that allowed it to survive in environmental conditions which eventually thought to lead to the evolution of tetrapods so tetra four feet in, four pod feet four feet in, four feet so to learn more about tiktaalik rosei uh, i recommend that you visit this from university of chicago 
I'll provide the link in the description below. So again, tiktaalik is a transitional fossil. It has a mix of both fish and amphibian traits. Now, the fossil record is not only important in completing um, um, our in completing how we visualize how ancestral uh, groups of organisms evolved into their descendant forms. Even fossil record shows us how it is possible to, to map out the ecological relationships of living things in the past and how they can actually influence the, uh, their relationships in the, um, in the modern period. So this video from California Academy of Sciences, they try to map out the fossil records and see how, the, how, they, how they could form the food chains and food webs of those organisms and how they, it is uh, related to the modern day uh, time. So I recommend that you watch this video. I'll provide the link in the description below. The second evidence of evolution would be the anatomical record. So, uh, so the first one would be homology, homology, homo similar, similar, the same. So as vertebrates evolved, some same the same bones were sometimes put into different uses. Yet the bones are still seen, and their pre their presence betraying their evolutionary past. So for example, we have um, two, un two unrelated vertebrates that still have that still possess the same type of bones, but eventually um, evolved to look different um, to be well adapted to their environment. So, the, for example, the four limbs of vertebrates are all homologous structures. Homologous it means they are similar, or structures with different appearance and the functions that are derived from the same body part of a common ancestor. So similar origin okay, similar origin of those structures so the first is um, for limbs homologous structure so for example this shows us the homology of the bones of the four limb of mammals so as you can see these are the four limbs of humans okay four limbs of cat so they share similarities so they have regius and ulna then um, carpals metacarpals so they have the same almost the same structures in cats same same structure uh, but different functions for bat okay but they have similarities uh, possibly because they have the same ancestor even in porpoise right they look like dolphins but you know they're they're different species okay so it's regius ulna um, carpals metacarpals and then even in horses uh, four limbs, radius ulna, um, carpals which evolve into this long bone there, then metacarpals here. So these structures show considerable, considerable differences in form and function. However, the same basic bones are present in the four limbs of these representative animals, all suggesting that they might have a common ancestor. The second evidence for anatomical record are vestigial structures. So these are structures that have no function anymore but are still present in that organism because it, it's presumed that it, it is derived from its ancestor. So its ancestor had it, so it's still, it's still present in that organism even if that organism is not using it anymore. So humans, for example, we co possess a complete set of muscles for wriggling our ears just as other as coyote and other animals, um, mammals um, have, but you know, we do not, we cannot wiggle our ears or not all of humans can wiggle their ears anymore. So this one is an example of vestigial uh, feature. So the baleen whale, okay, a representative group of mammals, still co largest living species, still has a pelvic bone, even if it has no hips. So what's the function of the pelvic bone? It's just floating there. Okay? It means that it's possible that the ancestor of the baleen whale used to have pelvic bone and, and pelvis and hips but eventually this group evolved uh, to, to lose the function of the pelvis and then to have this more uh, straight uh, um, this more um, simpler backbone that's that's better for or better better adapted for swimming in its environment but it still kept its um, um, pelvic bone even if it does not use it anymore okay so these are weakly developing whale and have no apparent function so in humans, okay, the appendix is a vestigial structure. Okay, our ancestors used to. Uh, it's important for our primitive ancestors because they use the. They, this is mostly a site for white blood cell production. 
which is um, quite important based on their diet. But for modern humans, we do not have that much uh, use anymore, except still for white blood cell production. These are the vestigial hind legs or spurs in a boa constrictor. So it, it still has a small hind legs, but you know, a boa constrictor is a snake, so uh, it's a constrictor, so it does not um, walk, it crawls. So there's no purpose for this hind legs anymore. So, but still, it only suggests that uh, it's possible that the ancestors of boa constrictors used to have legs. Um, this is what uh, we were talking about a while ago, that humans still have muscles that would allow us to move our um, ears, but not all of us can move it um, that well. Okay? We do not have the same mobility as other um, animals that we are related to. Um, goosebumps are also examples of vestigial structures so if you've noticed this in dogs and cats whenever they get stressed or angry uh, their their hair will stand on its end okay to make themselves appear bigger against their enemies so humans we used to be covered with uh, our ancestors used to be covered with fur so they have this ability but humans evolved over millions and millions of years our um line our, our line of ancestors evolved to have fewer and fewer um, hair on our skin. So we, we lost this ability to, to make our hair stand on its end. But the, the reaction of goosebumps is still embedded in our uh, bodies. And then the blind mole rat still has tiny eyes, if completely covered by a layer of skin, if it is, even if it does not uh, spend, its, spend or use its eyes to... Um, to view its surroundings. So why does it still have eyes? It means that its ancestor used to have eyes. Then uh, further, um, further along, so still under anatomical record, embryology and development. So we have homology or homologous structures, we have vestigial structures, then we have embryology and development. It says that some of the strongest, strongest um, anatomical evidence supporting evolution comes from the comparison of how organisms develop. So the evolutionary history of an organism can be seen to unfold during its development. And this is the driving point. Embryo exhibiting characteristics of the embryos of its ancestors. So these are embryos of um, organisms. So this is how the embryo of a fish look like, embryo of a reptile, embryo of a bird, and embryo of humans. So as you can see, we share structures with each other, gill slits, so, by the way, uh, embryos are, are growing, um, they grew from zygotes and then eventually become an embryo. Then the embryo will go into, grow into a fetus, okay? So, these are developing offspring, okay? When they're still uh, in embryonic stage. So, fish and reptiles still have gill slits, birds and humans. In our embryonic development, we still have gill slits eventually because our ancestors used to live underwater. So they have gill slits, but we all evolved in different paths. Eventually, we will lose these gill slits as the embryo um, grows and develops. It only, it only um, states that, it only tells us that we have a common ancestor. Then we also have fish and uh, that we also have tail like fish, reptiles, and birds, even humans. Okay, It's just that we lost, we lost our tail as our species um, evolved. But even in embryonic development in the, of, of human baby, of human fetus, um, human offspring, we still retain those tail, which will eventually disappear um, as the embryo grows. Okay? The third major piece of evidence for evolution would be the molecular record. It says that traces of our evolutionary past are also evident at the molecular level. So the fact that organisms have evolved successively from relatively simple ancestors implies that a record of evolutionary change is present in the cells in each of us, specifically in our DNA. So this is the, the main thing here. When an ancestral species give rise to two or more descendants, those descendants will initially exhibit fairly high overall similarity in their DNA. Okay? And according to the uh, evolutionist um, and biologist Charles uh, Richard Dawkins, the molecular record is one of the strongest piece of evidence that shows us uh, that we are actually related with each other. The fact that we share genetic similarities with each other. Okay? 
Um, however, as the, the sentence evolve independently, they ac will accumulate more and more differences in their um, DNA. So, um, so the further they are from each other, the, the, the fewer their similarities are, and the closer they are to each other, those two species, the more similarities that they will share. So organisms that are mostly, in, like what I'm trying to say, organisms that are mostly distantly related will be expected to accumulate greater number of differences, whereas those that are closely related, they could share greater portion of their DNA. So let's consider this diagram that shows us the differences um, in amino acid um, between two species. Okay, so. According to molecular record as an evidence of evolution, the closer two species are, the greater their similarities and the farther they are, the, the greater their difference when it comes to um, DNA. And here it shows us the number of amino acid differences between hemoglobin pepto, pep, polypeptide and human one. So, for example, humans and macaque, we share, we only have eight different amino acids from them. And that's that's few. It means that the rest of the amino acids we we are we are the same. We are similar with the species of primates. Between humans and dogs, we only have 32 different amino acids from them, and we share the rest. Okay, so we only have 32 differences, so we are not quite far from them in terms of evolutionary tree. Humans and birds, we have 45 different amino acids from them. And between humans and frogs, we have 67 different amino acids from them. But basically, the rest of the amino acids, they are the same with, humans are the same with this species. In this diagram, the farthest would be the lamprey. So that's a group of jawless fish. We have 125, the most, 125 different amino acids from this species. So again, the closer they are, with humans, the greater similarities that they have with, with us, the farther they are from us, evolutionarily speaking, the, the greater our difference. And we all know that amino acids, um, if you still remember our lesson on central dogma, amino acids are the products of, of those processes that are ultimately based on the DNA code, right? on, on the DNA strand of that organism. So DNA, uh, amino acids are correspond to possibly DNA, DNA similarities and differences. Now, to learn more about how our DNA proves evolution is real, I recommend that you watch this video from It's Okay to Be Smart. Very interesting. Uh, this is a requirement for you. I'll, I'll provide the link in the description below. The last major evidence for evolution would be artificial selection. So, humans have imposed selection upon plants and animals since the dawn of civilization. So just the same with natural selection, and we've talked about this, by which um, he, um, living organisms try to adapt to their environment due to overpopulation and due to variation within, within the population. And those variations that are better suited are the ones who will survive and pass on their traits. So, so that's natural selection. Artificial selection are, are done through human intervention, okay? So it operates by favoring by humans favoring individuals with certain phenotypic traits and allowing them to reproduce and pass their traits into the next generation. Now, assuming that phenotypic differences are genetically determined, and this is actually quite true, we have established it, this through um, genetics, such selection, such artificial selection, artificial by humans, artific artificial selection should lead to evolutionary change and indeed it has and we have a lot of evidences for that so this is artificial selection or selection or selective breeding in a nutshell so there, this is if this is the population of whatever organism that you are working on you choose to be the parents um, those organisms those individuals with those desirable characteristics that you want and they will be the ones to become the parents of the new of the new population so therefore it is expected that if if you prefer for example for this plant to have this um, you want this tall height of the plants even if you breed them it's understandable that most of their offspring will have the same phenotype or same traits so for the next generation you only choose these organisms to breed and then it will create 
taller and taller plants um, in the future. So it shows us the effect of selectively breeding in this example for height of plants, but the same principle is done in other organisms. We have done that in um, corn. Um, so this is the modern corn, and if you actually go back in time and trace, we have done selective breeding on T. Sinti, the ancestor of corn. And as you can see, it's not as plump, it's not, it's not as um, delectable and juicy and um, delicious compared to our modern corn. But through selective breeding, we were our ancestors were, a were able to breed it into what we know modern corn um, as they look today. We've done that in other plants, for example, for a wild mustard plant. We have done selective breeding or artificial selection for it just by and we have created several variants just by focusing on the traits that we wish to develop so for example um, all of these are the descendants of this ancestor wild mustard plant but we have kohlrabi we're in the the artificial selection focused on the stem kale we're in the artificial or selective breeding focus on the leaves broccoli on the buds uh, flower buds and stem, Brussels sprouts, lateral leaf buds, so those are the ones that were favored, <clears throat> and bred um, artificially, cabbage, who would have known, cabbage are actually from wild mustard, we're in the desirable trait that were, um, the desirable traits that was, uh, traits that were um, uh, selectively bred was the terminal leaf bud and flower buds, buds for cauliflower. We've all also done selective breeding, in um, dogs okay so all dogs have the wolf ancestor but different parts of the of the globe different countries different regions have bred the wolf into their desirable traits to give rise to the different dog breeds that we know today okay so from the wolf as ancestor different regions of the world have bred them that's why from from uh, wolf ancestor we now have this greyhound because these are the result this is the result of the desirable traits that we have selectively bred. We have a Mastiff, Chihuahua, and Dachshund. By the way, it's Dachshund, huh? not Dachshund. Dachshund. It's the it's German word for badger dog. Dachs, ba badger, hund, dog. So badger dog, because you know, they, they, they chase badgers, right? So they were bred actually to chase badgers, okay? So the differences between dog breeds are actually evidences or evidence that it's possible to alter, to alter, to change the phenotypes and possibly genotypes of an ancestor through selective breeding, through artificial selection. We've also done that for sheep. So wild mouflon is the ancestor of this domesticated sheep, but we have actually bred the, them uh, selectively and artificially to become the docile and woolly sheep that we know. Okay, so we continuously Following this principle, we continuously bred those parents um, with desirable traits and then continuously do that for the rest of the generations. Um, and we have continuously done that today in modern poultry and modern um, cattle. Okay, So these are different types of um, cattle based on, their based on the traits that were considered desirable. So the Brahman cattle has good resistance to heat, so possibly that was what's needed in that country but but poor beef or poor um, food content okay, or poor poor body parts that very few body parts that can be con that can be cut and sold as beef english shorthorn cattle good beef but poor heat resistance so the opposite while the santa get through this cattle um, it is formed by crossing these two so has good heat resistance and has good beef in its body so this is an example we have modified this the, the lineage of these two by combining them and breeding this um this new um new breed of cattle also in chicken growth so if we compare the size of chicken from 1957 to modern um uh, modern measurements you'll see that there's this drastic increase in the size from uh just weighing around two pounds in 1957, 56 day old chickens are now wearing, uh, weighing 9.26 pounds. That's um, more than twice, more than thrice its original size. So we were able to do that through artificial breeding and um, uh, through selective breeding and artificial um, selection. So artificial selection imposed in laboratory experiments, agriculture, and domestication has produced substantial change substantial change substantial change 
from their ancestors, suggesting that selection, whether artificial or natural, are effective evolutionary process and effective um, forces that can actually trigger evolution in species. That ends our, our video. It's quite a long one, but we had a lot to discuss. So again, those are the evidence that support evolution, and these are from different fields of studies and different fields of, um, fields of expertise, but they all refer to the same thing. It is possible for descent to modification to happen. And um, we will, uh, in, the in the future videos, we will discuss. So we've seen the introduction, we've seen the discovery or the history, we've seen the evidence. In the future video, we will talk about the mechanisms. So how does evolution happen? We've seen the evidence, so how, we want to know how does it happen and what are the different um, pathways by which evolution could occur. So we will discuss that in our in, we will discuss that in our future video. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Uh, until next time, goodbye.